Hello, my name is Ernie Guzman. I'm the Senior Manager of Technical Support at Twist Bioscience, and I'd like to welcome all of you to today's presentation entitled Antibody Discovery at the Edge of Impossible. Uh, it looks like we have a number of people joining us here today from around the world. Uh, I see New Zealand, uh, Manchester, um, France. That's fantastic. We'd like to extend a warm welcome to all of you. Today, we will hear about antibody screening using the Million Display. Mammalian display can provide insights into the development of therapeutic molecules. However, the number of clones that can be screened by mammalian display is typically too low to power antibody discovery campaigns. To address this challenge, Oxygen has developed a novel mammalian display system that enables the screening of over a hundredfold more variants than traditional approaches. But before we begin the presentation, just a couple of quick housekeeping rules to cover. First, all lines will be muted during the webinar. This is to reduce any distractions during the presentation. Secondly, we will have a Q&A session at the end. Please submit your questions in the Q&A box. We will answer your questions after the presentation is complete. And finally, after the presentation, there will be a short one minute survey that we would really appreciate you taking. Your feedback will help us improve future webinars. So our feature speaker for today is Dr. Nathan Robertson. Nathan is group leader of the antibody discovery team at Oxygen working towards the development of novel mammalian display technologies. Prior to joining Oxygen, he was a principal scientist for 10 years at Hiptars Therapeutics, working on thermal stabilization and structural studies of GPCRs for drug discovery, and a postdoctoral researcher at the Institute of Cancer Research. Additionally, Nathan has a PhD in biophysics from Imperial College, London. And with that, I'd like to bring on Dr. Nathan Robertson. Thank you very much, Ernesto, for that very kind introduction. Hopefully you can all hear me well, and thank you very much for joining me today. Um, so during my slide session, I've tried to avoid um, the top right-hand corner um, of any data, of any text. Um, so you should be able to position um, my video feed in the top right corner and hopefully see everything that's uh, on the slides. So um, I'm going to give you um, Kind of two-part talk. Uh, the first half is the technology itself. Um, what is this slim mammalian display technology we keep referring to? Um, how does it work and the process in-house in we've developed Oxygen. The second half of our talk will be a proof of principle study um, against the membrane protein EPCAM where we've uh, identified novel antibodies against this target using our system, screening a naive library in a fully mammalian system. So Without further ado, I'll tell you a little bit about the company, Oxygen. So we're based just south of Oxford in Oxford Science Park, and we're also formerly known as Oxford Genetics. There's a lot of Oxfords in the, in the name there. We've now rebranded to Oxygen. That happened last year. Um, it was originally founded by Ryan Carood, our CEO, back in 2011, and we're currently 95 employees. So as I mentioned in the talk, it'll be split into um, Two, mostly, um, an overview of the technology, and then a test case, and also going to describe how we use twist DNA technologies to help us make our own in-house SCFE libraries using the strengths that twist biosciences have. So um, a little bit about the slim display technology. So it's a recombinant animal-free um, um, antibody discovery uh, method in a fully mammalian cell system. The membrane proteins that we're targeting with this system are presented in a native configuration on the cell surface in the same cells we're using to screen the antibodies with. And our main purpose for developing this technology was for the identification of therapeutic antibodies or antibody mimetics, and even for those formatted for CAR-T discovery applications. We're currently adapting this for affinity maturation studies with a commercial partner. And we believe that any hits you find using the system have a built-in develop developability with downstream uh, development because it's uh, the same cells we use to discover these antibodies, which are the Cho cells, are exactly the same cells used to overexpress commonly this antibody therapeutic um, downstream. So how does this uh, technology work? So this first slide here is, is a, a lot of uh, diagrams and data, but the premise of this is that we need to make a cell line that overexpresses our target membrane protein under a test inducible promoter. So that's the whole aim of this um, experimental setup here. We do this using lentiviruses. So we have a, a strength in oxygen um, of lentiviral um, uh, packaging. 
Um, we incorporate our antigen of interest um, into the packaging genome of a lentivirus, which is our membrane protein. And we transduce this, uh, uh, these CHO cells with this lentivirus. And we then use a fact sort to isolate the high expressing cells in that population. We expand those clones out to a large cell culture. And these are the cells we use to screen our antibodies with. So we've got some example um, fact spots down below to show the kind of expression levels we achieve um, against three different membrane protein targets. We've got EPCAM shown on the left and two GPCR targets uh, shown on the middle and the right. In the red in each case are those cells that are induced under doxycycline con um, conditions. In blue is in the absence of doxycycline and the black are just control cells. So you can see in each case, there is some leaky expression, but generally we see quite a good uh, difference between the expression levels with or without doxycycline. And this helps us in our process downstream. So the whole aim of this is that the membrane protein is presented in a therapeutically relevant setting on the surface of these cells in their native lipid environment. The next stage of the process is once we've expanded our cell line out, to about 4 billion cells, we then transduce with another lentivirus preparation, which is now packaging an SCFE library. These SCFEs contain an N-terminal secretion sequence. So these are secreted SCFEs and a C-terminal affinity tag for identification. And we transduce such a large cell culture with an MOI of about 0.8. Um, the reason why we do this, we want to maximize the number of sim single integration events um, in our CHO cell culture. And the main aim of this is that each cell co-expresses a target antigen and a single member of the SCFE library. And that's the main aim of this. And at MOI 0.8, you get just under about 40% of those cells that are expressing a single SCFE variant. And what happens is if that SCFE binds to the target antigen on the cell surface, they become self-labeled. And that's where this name SLIM comes from, self-labeling integral membrane display. And this is a signal that we use to isolate and enrich for in our process. And the workflow that we use is first using the uh, MAX, or in our case, an AutoMAX, and this is using magnetic nanob technology. So because you can't put 4 billion cells through a fax sorter, you really have to debulk this population down quite significantly just to the tens of millions of cells before we can apply a fax sort. And this is where the magnetic nanob separation comes in. So any cell that is self-labeling in this system will become decorated by magnetic nanobees using uh, this antibody, which is to the C-terminus of the SCFE, and the magnetic nanobees then bind to the fluorophore, which is on the antibody. And this is how the cells become magnetically labeled. We then pass them through the Automax, which enriches for those cells that are magnetically labeled. And we can repeat this procedure up to three times. And this, um, very much enriches all those cells that are self-labeled in the process to from 4 billion down to about 10 million cells. At this point, we can apply a fact sort and to single cells and expand these clones out. And this is the point we start testing those cells to ensure they're generally secreting an SCFE that binds our target antigen. So where does this technology fit with the more traditional technologies? So on the right, we're shown a phage display system here, which can handle extremely large library sizes, up to 10 to 11, which is perfect for naive library screening. Um, however, some of the issues are that typically, not always the case, they, you require the antigen to be soluble and purified recombinantly. However, a lot of groups use uh, wholesale panning, panning now with phage display. Um, and sometimes you need to optimize any hits you find in this system, sometimes with the more traditional main display system shown on the left. And with this more traditional mainly display system, you are hampered by much smaller library sizes of 10 to 7. So it's more often used for affinity maturation and optimization. Again, the antigen typically is required to be purified recombinantly. Um, however, the pros of this system is that you can work with full IgG um, formatting um, of the antibodies, and any hits you find are compatible with the mainly expression systems. Uh, our slim display method in the center here. Um, fits in between these two in terms of library sizes. So at the moment, we're handling library size of about 10 to the nine. And at this point, we can start to screen naive libraries. Everything is performed in CHO cells, the same cells used for downstream development. And the antigen doesn't require purification and it's 
presented on the cell surface in a physiologically relevant uh, manner with all the epitopes and post transplanted modifications intact. And therefore, this is very useful for membrane proteins and those difficult to express and purify antigens. So now a little bit about the libraries, and this is where TWIST Bioscience really helped us. Um, so we have a number of libraries in-house. This is one of the first we made. Um, and what we try to do here is um, basically combine all the known human VDJ segments and reshuffle them and clone them into our lentiviral plasmid. And TWIST Bioscience were able to provide these DNA inserts for us, um, optimize these DNA um, fragments by codom optimization. They're able to remove all the restriction sites that we wanted to use in the cloning procedure and remove any um, detrimental motifs. So this was really, really helpful and, uh, and worked really, really well. So TWIST provided us all the fragments and we then used a uh, basically standard cloning strategy in-house to recombine these in our plasmids. We electroporated this many, many times to get as a higher diversity as possible. Um, and in the end, once we had our final library, we did some NGS um, and we did some uh, colony counting of dilution of plates to ensure to calculate how many variants we had. So this is a it's a it's a busy slide, but this just shows a snapshot of the bioinformatic analysis of the NGS of this library, showing a range of CDR lengths across all six CDRs, as well as the amino acid compositions across those six CDRs. And this might be a little bit clearer, but just to focus on the CDRs L3 and H3, we've got a logos here across those CDRs, with the lengths, and everything looked pretty good at this point. We we're quite happy with this, and we determined we had approximately five times the eight library members um, by counting dilution plates of polymers. So that's how many transformants we had. And this is the library that we used in our proof of principle project against FCAM, which I'll describe to you later. So that's the first half of the talk, uh, describing the technology and how we do our screening um, using our slim display method. And now how, how have we applied this to um, an actual target, in this case, EPCAM, which is an, on, um, an oncogene um, overexpressed in many uh, cancer cells. Oh, someone raised their hand. Um, I was wondering if you could wait till the end um, and I'll answer all your questions then, if that's okay. So what we've done here um, against EPCAM is um, made our cell lines, um, expanded this cell line up to about four, around um, two to four billion cells and then transduced with our chess library, our SCFE library that I've just described to you. That's an MOI, of, or in this case we used MOI of one, so it's a little bit higher than we normally do. And then we applied our max enrichment method. So each of these scatter plots shows the self-labeling signal at each of the different rounds of the Automax procedure. So on the far left, this is what the self-labeling signal looks like when there's no enrichment process taking place. And as you'd expect, it's extremely low signal. Um, so there'll be very, very few binders there to begin with. And as we go through the process of magnetic nanobead enrichment, this self-labeling signal dramatically increases to about 86%. At this point, there's no need to do any more magnetic nanobead selection. It won't improve this any further. Um, and the reason being is that we have three populations um, in, this, in this magnetic nanobead enriched um, population. And we're only interested in one of them. So we have obviously many cells that are secreting SCFVs that bind to off-target membrane proteins on the Cho cell surface. So how do we remove those? We also have many cells that are being dragged through this pr procedure by cross-labeling. So if a neighboring Cho cell is secreting an SCFV that binds to something on that surface, it may actually find another cell and label other cells. How do we remove these cross-labeled cells? So I'm going to describe you how we remove those two populations, leaving us behind Cho cells that are secreting SCFV that bind our target antigen. So the first method we use is introducing what is like a cellular sponge. So these are decoy cells. So we have our enriched population in orange on the left, and we introduce a much larger ratio of non-secreting decoy cells, which is on the right. So they express our target antigen. They don't secrete SCFV, but we have labeled these with a live cell dye, in this case, CMAC. And what happens is when you introduce 
this large ratio of non-secreting cells, they bind and mop up all the free SCFE in the cell culture media, dramatically reducing our cross-labeling signal. So as you can see, a couple of facts plots. So on the left are, are enriched population cells without any decoy cells, and you can see extremely high self-labeling signal, about 96%. I know these numbers are very small, um, but that shows 96% of self-labeling cells. And as you increase the number of decoy cells in the system, you dramatically reduce this signal down to about 60%. And this really improves our positive hit selection. The next strategy we use is um, the incorporation of a FRET-based strategy in our fact sorts. And the reason we do this is we want a way to be distinguished between SCFEs that bind our target antigen and those that just bind something else on the Cho cell surface. So this is where we use PrEP. In the case of EPCAM, we purchased a commercially available antibody, which has an acceptor fluorophore, shown in the green. And what happens in this case is if you then come in with another antibody to the C-terminal HA tag of the SCFE, which is a donor fluorophore, then the proximity of these two co-binding our antigen on the cell surface generates a FRET signal. And this is a signal we use to sort for on the facts. So if our SCFE binds something else on the cell surface, then you should have an extremely weak or, or no threat signal at all. In the case of this example, um, obviously we're occluding part of the ECD with this antibody, this commercial antibody. So many of the projects that we've used um, from this point onwards, we've generated an affinity tag on the antigen itself. So we don't require an antibody to our antigen to use our slim display method. It just happens in this case, there was one available already. Um, and this still works very well. So we use this FRET-based system to sort those cells into single cells, and then we expanded those single cells out. So this is an example of a plate where we sorted single cells in each well, and the cells were expanded. And after about three weeks, we can start um, to then triage these cells and test them to see, are they actually secreting an SCFE that is specific to our target antigen? or to something else, or they're not secreting anything um, at all in this case. So what we've done here is it split these clones up into two, and cultured them either in the absence or in the presence of doxycycline, and then measured the self-labeling signal. So it's a very simple experiment to do. So if we're secreting an SCFE that binds EPCAM, we should only see a self-labeling signal in the presence of doxycycline. Um, and this is what's shown here. So each of these is a clone in triplicate, and you can see a number of different clones here. Some are binding our cells either with or without doxycycline. So these are our false binders. So it's not 100% perfect, the FRET system. And you will get some um, off-target binders coming through. But you have a number of clones that only light up in the presence of doxycycline. And this is a fax plot of one of those clones shown on the right. And these are the cells we're interested in. To be um, doubly sure that we're only selecting those clones that are secreting a binder, we can actually take the supernatants from those clones and transfer them to fresh cells, which are either expressing EPCAM or are negative to EPCAM. And this is a cross-labeling experiment. Um, and this bar chart shows supernatants from those clones transferred to either Cho control cells, which are the left bars of each plot, or on the right of each is EPCAM positive um, Cho cells. So you can see quite a number of supernatants are only binding to EPCAM positive cells, Again, you've got a few that are false positive and a few that are not binding at all. And we use these two experiments to triage all our clones um, and then focus our attention on those specific clones that look like they're expressing a binder to our target antigen. At this point, we don't know the sequence of the SCFE. So we need to PCR out the SCFE gene, sequence this, and then we can reformat it to IgG and do further studies. And this is what we've done here. So of all the clones we identified, uh, we found four unique sequences that we could confirm binding to EPCAM in our studies, either as an SCFE or as an IgG. And once we have an IgG, we can then purify these um, IgG variants and perform some biophysical characterization of these. So we can do some EC50 studies against whole cells expressing EPCAM, which is shown on the, the top middle. And we can also do some SPR analysis. And this SPR was done in the presence of the soluble extracellular domain of EPCAM. And um, because with SPR, you typically need only, soy, uh, you can only work with only soluble proteins. 
And again, we saw a range of affinities with SPR from sub nanomolar to about 60 nanomolar from our um, variants. One of the variants um, shows such a low affinity, we couldn't even determine the, um, a KD on our SPR experiments for this one. So out of these four, three of them looked like they were giving us some reasonable data. And we wanted to see, are these functional? So to do this, we actually tested these in a CAR-T setting. So we generated a panel of second generation CAR-Ts with our three SCFEs um, and engineered, made a lentivirus of these and engineered either primary T cells or JERCAT cells um, and then exposed these to EPCAM positive MCF7 cells or CHO cells expressing EPCAM to see are they being activated and will they kill those cells specifically in the presence of EPCAM on the cell surface. So the, the panel of four on the top here are the primary T cells. And as you can see, two of the three SCFEs show specific activation um, against CHEROAPCAM cells, either using the CD25 positive signal or in the cytotoxicity assay. Um, and this is uh, CHO control cells showing the, basically these cells grow normally. They're not affected by the primary T cells. But when you expose the primary T cells to cheer up cells and measure their cell index, you can see dramatic cell killing. And for two of those SCFEs, one of the SCFEs and the CD9, CD19 uh, control didn't show any effect. And with the engineered JERCAT cells, in this case, we only saw one of the SCFEs showing activity and there may be a hint of activity with the other. So what I've been hopefully been able to show you that we're able to screen a naive library in our CHO cell system against that can identify um, a number of unique SCFEs and show that these can be active in a CAR-T setting. Um, the last few slides now of what we're doing currently. Um, one of the things that we're currently working on is adapting our methods for affinity maturation using the slim display. This is with a commercial partner and this is against the GPCR target. And what we've done here is we've taken their humanized SCFE parental generated um, a, either a CDRL3 or H3 library comprising all possible double mutations across those CDRs, made a lentivirus and transduced CHO cells are overexpressing our GPCR target. We then put these cells under very stringent wash conditions and then select for the self-labeling signal that survives these stringent conditions. And uh, hopefully I'm not covering that data on the right, but um, this uh, plot here is our parental SCFE and the dark red is non-washed um, self-labeling signal. And after a few washes, this SCFE gets stripped off quite easily. However, we've been able to identify variants that not only give us a much improved signal, but they retain the cell surface signal self-labeling even after quite stringent washing. So we believe this is working very well. We're able to identify much affinity improved variants using our method and fish these out of these uh, CDR, L3, and H3 libraries that we've introduced these cells with. And the very last slide, um, just currently what we're working on, it's very topical. Many other teams are working on COVID-19 antibody uh, therapeutics um, strategies, very successful at the moment, um, but we want to throw our hat in the ring and see, can we use our slim display method to find novel antibodies against the COVID-19 spike protein? And we think this has some novelty because we're working with the full length wild type COVID spike protein presented in a lipid environment in the cell surface, which may produce some novelty, some slightly different binders, as you'd expect just working with the soluble domains. So what we have done here is we've generated cell lines expressing either the full length wild type on the cell surface of hex cells um, or a fury mutant. Um, and the reason we've done this is that there's a fury mutant between the S1 and S2 domains um, which is cleaved, and upon cleaving, this can shed the S1 domain and potentially um, push the COVID spike protein um, into a post-fusion conformation, as shown here. And this is what the wild-type spike protein could be doing on the surface of cells. So we therefore generated a few mutants to stop this from happening and keep it in the pre-fusion conformation. And now we're currently using both these cell lines to pan our SCFE libraries in our slim display method to try and identify any novel binders. Um, present in the lipid environment. So this is the end of my talk. Um, hopefully I've been able to show you that our platform can identify um, binders, novel binders against membrane protein targets in a fully CHO cell line system. 
um, how Twist have been very um, extremely useful um, in helping us make our first SCFE libraries using the, the strength of the Twist technology to develop uh, and generate DNA fragments, which are fully optimized for our system. And how our excuse me, and how our antigen is present on the cell surface in a fully folded, stable, and a physiologically relevant setting. Okay, um, thank you, Nathan, oh. for your presentation. <laughs> Can I just just want to say before you jump in, I wanted to thank um, three people at Oxygen who basically I showed all their data, and they're the they're the real heroes of this. So that's Nancy. Lopez, Anton, Shalem Gujar, Maria, Valdivia, Cruz at Oxygen. who worked really hard. Um, they're a fantastic team. So a massive credit to them for uh, this novel technology that I presented you today. And uh, I also to say that this work was initially funded by Innovate UK. Sorry to interrupt you there, Ernesto. Thank you. No, no, my, my apologies, Nathan. Thank you so much for your presentation. Uh, just as a reminder, if you have any questions for Nathan, uh, there is a Q&A box. It should be located at the bottom of the screen. Go ahead and just type your question there and I'll read it out to Nathan. Um, just a couple of questions here. Um, can you, Nathan, can you share uh, more about how you play with stringency when you're looking at the affinity matured SCFEs, please? Um, no, absolutely. So we've tried a few different methods. Um, I mean, one of the methods was just straightforward and just looking at self-labeling signal and the strength of that signal in our process and just fish out those cells that have an increased signal um, however, we have been, as mentioned in this data set I've showed you, washing those cells stringently, um, I, um, either very prolonged periods of time um, in uh, like a PBS-like buffer to try and isolate cells that are secreting binders that have a much longer off rate. That was our attempt to do this. Um, so that's how one of the ways we can introduce stringency. One other way we can do this and we haven't tried this yet, is because our antigen is under a doxycycline inducible system, we can actually tie to much lower amounts of doxycycline to induce lower levels of expression and therefore find those that are able to still generate a high signal even in the presence of low levels of antigen. I hope um, that's answered the question. Okay. Uh, kind of, a, I guess I'm on a related question. Are both the SCFE and the antigen under doxycycline control? Uh, no, only the antigen. Um, the SCFEs are continually being expressed. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, what are the typical timelines for a screen followed by uh, affinity metrization? So, yes, yeah, so the timelines are kind of split into two parts. We have to make our cell line first, which typically takes about six weeks. Once we have that cell line, it's about four, four and a half months to commit to a full campaign to identify our first novel binders. So it's about six months in total from beginning to end. And for the affinity maturation, that's much faster because um, you don't need to do um, the Automax procedure. You can go straight into a fax sort um, because the library size is much smaller. So maybe around three to four months. Um, how does the variability in expression levels of the SCFV affect the selection process? It's a very good question. So we're not able to um, validate what the levels of expression in the SCFEs are. So we can only see um, the SCF expression once they bound to a cell. So we are only picking out those SCFEs that are being well expressed. Um, it's, it's something that we're trying to answer at the moment. And um, we need to try at the moment develop an ELISA system to try and measure what the SCFV variability is like across our libraries. But that's something we, we don't know yet. Um, have you tested the system using uh, heterodimeric proteins uh, as, as the antigen? No, we haven't, um, but we, that would be a very interesting type of antigen to test for, yes. Um, we could incorporate our FRET strategy to ensure we are only targeting the complex, the proteins as well. Uh, another question is, is there, any cultural, is there any culture recovery steps between MAC selection and if so, do you check the library diversity bias during the recovery and culture? So, um, no, we haven't checked the library diversity following the max. Uh, at that point, the library has been enriched. So we do expect there to be a much diminished diversity at that point. We, after the max procedure, there is some level of culture that needs to be applied to those cells to ensure a 
about a week or two before we can apply the facts. Um, how that diversity changes over that time, uh, we're not sure whether this, each clone grows slightly differently from the other. It's a very difficult um, thing to measure. What we have done is performed NGS analysis of our SCFE library, either as the parent plasmid, in present in the lentiviral preparation, and once transduced into those cells. So this was un before any enrichment is taking place, just to make sure we don't lose any diversity during the lentiviral preparation or the transduction. And the diversity is maintained during those three steps. Okay, uh, another question. Um, what is the advantage of co-displaying the SCFV on the CHO cells rather than using the antigen display CHO cells to screen uh, a traditional phage library? Yeah, um, so well, we believe the advantage is combining the strengths of a mainline display and a bit of the phage display in terms of library size number. So we believe that the SCFVs that survive our process are ones that are optimal and the ones that will be therapeutically relevant downstream. So they're compatible with mammalian expression. Um, and also they um, basically um, have, uh, will probably be more functional, we believe, downstream. So that's the reason why we've proposed this method. Um, the reason you can do phase display against whole cells expressing a target antigen. Um, from my understanding, you do get a lot of false binders coming through, which you have to triage those away. Um, another question is, is there any bias of SCS, uh, SCFB expression level differences uh, in each of the CHO cells? Can you repeat the question? Sorry. Is there any bias of SCFB expression level uh, in, each, in, the, in the CHO cells? So I'm assuming that means, is there a bias towards selecting those SCFEs that are expressing more than, than the typical library member? Um, if that is the case, if that is a question, forgive me if that's not the case, then I believe that's the strength of the system. You do want to select for those SCFEs that do express well in CHO cells. Um, I, I believe that's the whole purpose uh, of this. And you, don't, you want to avoid those that are not expressing or poorly expressed or aggregating and remove those from, from, from your library. Um, <clears throat> so another question, uh, how easy is it to control for different surface display levels due to random integration at different loci in the, in the lentiviral integration? Um, so this is for the antigen uh, expression. If, uh, yeah, if it is for the antigen expression, forgive me sure. again if I've misunderstood, um, we actually um, basically fax saw into clones of our cell lines. So we're actually working with a single clone. So the antigen expression is consistent across all, uh, across the whole cell culture. Okay. Uh, I guess on a somewhat related question, uh, do you ever see double integrants, um, double, double integration events in your library? Yeah, no, we do. It's very difficult to avoid because it's a, it's a bit of a balancing act between library size. We want to sample at the highest library size as possible, yet minimizing number of double integration events. And that's why we use this sample 5.8. Um, so we do see sometimes double integration events and we get around this at the end by what we do is we um, amplify out the SCFE genes from those clones um, and sequence them. If there are more than one SCFE gene there, um, we will see this in the Sanger sequencing and therefore we then clone these out, retransform and then sequence multiple colonies to see how many sequences are actually present. So there's a bit of deconvoluting at the end to identify those. Uh, a question, uh, how does the platform allow targeting receptors, GPCRs, with low surface expression levels uh, and more intracellular localization, for example, due to constitutive internalization? Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, I guess the short answer is we're not sure. Um, it's, it's something that does happen with GPCRs. They become cycle, they cycle through, especially particular GPCRs that have high constitutive activity by CAM activity, they become internalized. So how, we're not sure exactly what will happen with our self-labeling signal. Um, the signal that we have in our system is basically only picking out those that are present on the cell surface. So if an SCFE binds a GPCR and becomes internalized, we no longer can see it in our system um, and reach for that at all. So we would have lost some signal on the cell surface there. Um, so whether there's enough on the cell surface to pick that up or not, we have yet to determine that. 
with the GPCRs we have looked at so far, this doesn't appear to be an issue, but it could be a particular GPCR that could be an issue. We're not sure yet. Um, is, it, is it possible to uh, increase the antibody library sampling size beyond the 10 to the 9th that you achieved? It is possible. Um, our library size is limited by the number of cells we can culture at the very beginning of the process. And uh, so at the moment we're dealing with 4 billion cells, which gives us a library size of about one and a half billion uh, when you transduce with MR 0.8. So if we want to increase that library size, we need to culture more cells and transduce more cells at the beginning. So if we want a library size of three times 10 to the nine, then we need to double the number of cells that we culture. So that's okay. just down to space, incubator space and handling. Fair enough. Um, we're coming down to uh, kind of towards the end. So I just wanna ask one more question. Uh, have you tried SSI recombination for library generation in order to avoid any double or multiple of integrants? Um, we have looked into this for the cell line development, not for the antibody library um, integration. Um, you, it's a good idea because you're right, we're making sure um, our genes are incorporated into the Cho genome at a specific place, which should mean everything is a bit more uniform. I think one of the issues we've found is the efficiency um, of transfecting in our genes of interest into those cells and then becoming um, integrated into that site. So that was one of the issues that we did come across. It was quite a low efficiency and we need to ha have a high efficiency as possible um, with our system. And that's why we use lentiviruses. Okay. Um, we're coming very close to time and we wanna be respectful of everyone's schedule. I'm sorry, for any questions that we didn't have the opportunity to address, uh, please rest assured that we will reach out to you directly. Um, and finally, as a quick reminder, after you leave the webinar, you'll be redirected to a brief survey. If you have a moment to spare, we would really appreciate your feedback. I'd like to thank again, Dr. Nathan Robertson of Oxygen, and thanks to all of you for joining us today. Until next time, remember that science doesn't stop and neither will we. Stay safe and have a good day.